Perfect. All right. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Mo, uh, Design Director at FitXR currently. Uh, I wanted to give you a bit of a background about myself, and then we jump into a bit of a presentation or slides that I've prepared for, for this conversation. And I'm really excited about the QA session afterwards more than the, the presentation itself. Um, I'm a designer. I've been a designer for the last 18 years. I started from graphic design, branding, marketing, then switched to um, digital product design. And for the last almost six years, I've been focused on immersive technologies. And I started with um, AR and then VR. And um, here I am to share some of my learnings with you. As I didn't know what's the, the level of background and knowledge of people attending this, module. Um, I've tried to prepare kind of a basic, not too basic, um, kind of um, ground level information and knowledge that we will go through. And then when it comes to the QA sessions, you are absolutely um, open and willing to, to ask whatever you want. I won't guarantee that I have all the answers, but I'll try my best. Without further ado, let's start with the presentation. Um, okay, let me uh, share my screen. As I'll be uh, sharing my screen, I won't be seeing the chat, so please um, shout if you have any questions or you need any other point to discuss. Perfect. Um, I hope that you're seeing the presentation fine. Uh, we're going to talk about um, design for mixed reality. And um, I've prepared a few things to, um, to talk you through. These are the agenda. Um, I'll try my best to share the, the slides with you afterwards um, if that's needed. Um, as a bit of an introduction, um, I wanted to welcome you to this um, immersive dive into mixed reality. Today, uh, we're going to unravel the fabric of technology that seamlessly integrates with our natural world, enhancing our reality with digital interactivity. Um, let's set the stage uh, for understanding um, MR's unique place in the spectrum of immersive technologies. Most of um, the, the talking points here are not new. Um, you might have heard them uh, before, and most of them are actually applicable to any sort of interaction design from uh, product, product design, traditional product design, VR design, AR design, and MR design. Um, I had the chance for over the last uh, three years to work with um, a few um, XR related products, including Shapes XR, Gravity Sketch, and currently FitXR. And I also had the chance to design and develop and deliver um, XR products for almost all platforms and devices, including Oculus or now MetaQuest devices, Pico, Vive, Magic Leap, Magic Leap One, um, Index, and also everything started with Google VR and um, Samsung Gear VR. Um, thinking about the spectrum of realities, um, imagine a continuum, one and a tangible physical world around us, and the other end of um, this spectrum, this realm is a complete virtual reality. MR or mixed reality is in the middle, a symphony of real and imagined. Um, this is the canvas on which we all are going to kind of paint today. It's really important to understand the key features of mixed reality. As I listed here, um, I consider four main key features for mixed reality. First one would be real-time interaction with virtual objects. One of the main differences when it comes to augmented reality and mixed reality is the real-time interactions. For instance, if you're just overlaying digital content on physical environments without any sort of interaction, most likely that would fall under the AR spectrum rather than MR. MR requires real-time um, interaction with uh, virtual objects. 
Next key feature is a seamless integration of digital content into physical environments. Again, if you think about AR, most likely there's no integration. It's like maybe as um, heads of display, it's in front of you. Um, it attached, it doesn't interact with the physical surroundings. There is no occlusion and stuff like that. But when it comes to mixed reality, this symphony, this um, harmony of digital and real elements is really important. Next one is enhanced spatial awareness and depth perception. That's very key um, feature that we're going to talk about it. And the last one is the ability to manipulate and transform visual objects, which ties back to the um, interaction model. And we're going to talk about that. Um, just to think about the, the history and evolution, this is a long journey and MR roots um, trace back to early experiments of um, 1990s, but it was the advancement of sensors and display technologies that brought us to today sophisticated MR platforms such as um, MetaQuest Pro, MetaQuest 3, or my favorite one, um, Apple uh, Vision Pro, uh, which I had a chance to try on, and that's completely on, on another level. Um, this is a long journey. Decades of trial and errors um, heavily related and relying on technology. Without technology improvement, MR wouldn't survive and cannot survive going um, into the future. And it's kind of an upgrade to AR technologies. Thinking about why MR is some sort of a unique um, adventure for us. Designing for mixed reality is kind of a venture into uncharted territory from the description, from definition of MR to how we design and how we deliver. It's not about creating a world within um, a screen, um, but about bringing digital elements to life into our tangible world. It requires us to rethink the user interaction as users can now reach out and touch and manipulate digital objects um, alongside the physical objects. In the space, and experience around, we, we try to design as part of their reality. It's very important to don't see these uh, virtual or digital elements as something um, different, something apart from the reality, and that integration is really important. The user interface is no longer a flat screen. It's the 3D space they inhabit. In mixed reality in MR, we must consider not only how it looks, but how it feels, again, this is not new to MR. Usually when it comes to design, it's not how it looks and it's really how it feels and behaves. And it's not um, separate, it's not different in, in MR as well. It's, it's a very multi-dimensional context that we need to uh, keep in mind. Um, in order to dive deeper, you could start thinking about the MR applications. For instance, I've tried to, to list a few applications that comes to mind like training and simulation, product design and prototyping, entertainment and gaming, education and learning, collaboration and communication. If you, for, for example, think about product design and prototyping, if you wanted to um, design a new armchair, let's say, um, you either use some sort of a 2D um, environment from pen and paper, your tablet, or what, whatever tool you use, and you'll end up with a flat 2D um, sketch image representation of your idea. As the final product is not 2D, you have to try to re-sketch that to reiterate um, the idea from different viewport or angles. Another kind of improved approach would be using and leveraging some 3D um, software, let's say Blender. You're still using Blender in a 2D platform on a flat screen. Again, yes, you have your, your ideas um, designed or modeled in 3D, but you have to render from different aspects or um, export a run uh, turntable video. But if you think about tools that exist in VR and in, in MR, such as Gravity Sketch, you could really start from the context. Imagine you could start with a literally just a box that you would say, okay, this is tall enough, to sit on and then start drawing your legs, the armchair and the back and the seat around that within MR, within the context. And that's massively improved the, the product life cycle, the product speed and time to market. 
Um, I wanted to talk about basic principles of um, MR design. I've listed five principles. These principles are kind of going to, uh, to repeat throughout this presentation in terms of um, design best practices as well and challenges. So um, these are very kind of deep rooted in the MR concept. First one is um, spatial awareness. Mixed reality experiences take place in three dimensional spaces. And it's very important to design with a spatial awareness in mind, considering how users will, will navigate, how users interact with virtual objects and, and environments, not only virtual objects, also physical objects as well. We could use um, visual cues such as depth, scale, perspective, and stuff like that to create a sense of depth and presence in mixed reality environment. Next one, which is kind of hand in hand with the first one is um, intuitive interactions. We should design interactions that are intuitive and easy to understand and use. Users should be able to interact with virtual objects um, and environments in a very natural and intuitive way, considering using gestures or voice commands or other familiar interaction patterns to make the experience more accessible and user-friendly. For instance, one of the, um, the key that we um, tried always at Gravity Sketch was to try to go back to root physical interactions rather than jumping into a solution. For example, almost everyone knows how to open a, a kitchen drawer, how to pick up a, a knife, how to pick up a spoon. And that could be the, the building blocks of designing new interaction models. It doesn't necessarily need to um, basically be reinvented from scratch, but knowing and basically going back and trying to get as close as to physical, natural, intuitive interactions would help us massively. Because again, we need to consider, we need to um, bear in mind that mixed reality, it's a combination of real physical objects and virtual objects. If we want to truly keep our users engaged, we cannot have two different interaction models. We cannot expect them, let's say I have a cop here, we cannot expect a user to interact with this physical cop differently compared to something, a similar object in virtual world. So we need to uh, bring consistency and harmony in, in all of interactions. Um, next one is visual hierarchy. Um, we need to establish a clear visual hierarchy to guide our users' attention and focus in the mixed reality environment. If you think about designing um, for flat 2D screens, uh, it's, it's a, a fortune that we know our users are limited to some sort of a rectangle. And they know if they want to interact with this product, they have to focus within that frame. But when it comes to virtual reality or mixed reality, it's very hard to keep their attention and their focus. And it's our job as some sort of a director to guide their attention, to use visual cues, um, such as color, size, and placement, um, or even auditory cues to indicate the importance and relationship between different elements. This will help um, users navigate and understand the, the content and interactions within the mixed reality experience. Um, next one is performance optimization. Um, to optimize the performance of your mixed reality experience and ensure this is a smooth and responsive um, interactive um, interaction, it's, it's really important to consider the hardware limitation and capabilities. As a designer, you should be on top of the game of knowing what are the limitations, what are the capabilities. You don't necessarily need to understand the, uh, the deep technical um, layer of these technologies, but you need to, to be uh, fully aware of the limitations and capabilities of the target devices and optimize your designs accordingly. Another thing um, that you need to keep in mind, especially working in the small startups, is to um, try thinking cross-platform, not leveraging um, capability or technology which is available on one platform on one device and it's not available on others would limit your resources and it would um, delay the time to market for the product and experiences. Minimizing latency is another kind of um, subset of optimization and that we need to optimize our rendering, to optimize our visuals um, with using different algorithms, different um, tricks to create a seamless and immersive experience for users. And last but not least, which again, would apply to any sort of design is accessibility. Um, we should design mixed reality experiences 
that are inclusive and accessible to users with different abilities. Consider providing alternative modes for interaction models, such as voice command, gaze-based controls, um, or like duplicated control button mapping on different uh, controllers, right and left controllers, in order to ensure that content interactions are perceivable, operable, um, operable and understandable for all users. Um, again, I'm not seeing any chat and any questions, so I'll continue going through this. Uh, just shout if you need to, uh, to pause. Um, next, let's talk about the users. Um, I wanted to include users as uh, previous slide as the basic principles of mixed reality, but I thought users are more important and they deserve their own place, at least within this conversation. Uh, we should always keep users in mind and in heart. I'm missing a T here. Um, in mixed reality, the user is the center of a dynamic environment. This is very important. The physical space becomes a part of the experience, requiring our designers to adapt, uh, our designs to adapt and vary uh, to, to vary um, surroundings. It's very important that we're not designing for a blank canvas. We're basically designing on multiple backgrounds, multiple surroundings, which we don't know. It might, the other experiences might be open and go through within a living room, within a gym, outdoor, airplane, car, and it's very important to understand those. Ergonomics also play a crucial part. Um, for instance, how long can a user comfortably wear um, an MR or a VR headset? And how do the movement within the space affect um, interaction with the virtual elements? We strive to minimize cognitive load. This is very important, especially with mixed reality. If you think about cognitive load in virtual reality, you're in full control. If you want to lower the cognitive load, you do that easily. But in mixed reality, there are certain elements out of your control. If I'm in mixed reality, I'm watching, let's say, a video. I'm also in my peripheral um, vision. I'm also seeing my pets. My uh, partner might, might walk around. I might hear different things. I might see different things. And because of that, there is the level, the threshold of a cognitive load is usually higher than virtual reality. Why? Because we're not in full control. And therefore, we need to focus on creating experiences that enhance, not overwhelm. Um, for instance, let's talk. Let's think about a virtual assistant in a user's kitchen. It shouldn't. It should offer help without cluttering the space or interrupting the task. By understanding users' goals and expectations, you can create immersive and engaging experiences that meet their needs. But how we could understand goals and expectations? Again, traditional uh, phases of a design, of, of a product design, usually starts with user research and understanding and observation. We'll talk about that in detail more. Um, I wanted to talk about tools and technologies, but I didn't want to go like too deep. And I thought instead uh, we could um, talk about my preferred um, kind of set of tools. Um, the tools that we will shape the world that we build. I really love this um, this quote. I think it's it's very clear in terms of the the importance of the tools. But on the other hand, I would suggest never let tools or lack of tools hold you back. Um, we could use like very known and usual. Um, tools such as Figma with conjunction of um, XR plugins, such as um, a new one, which is called Layer Beam, which allows you to do a flat design in Figma, sync that in your VR headset and preview that in VR on MR. This is really, really easy. It's still in early stages, but it allows you to speed up your design and thought process without uh, spending time and resources on learning new softwares, learning new applications, but that's limited. Next step, uh, with more fidelity, with more capability, uh, might be some sort of a uh, 3D suite, maybe Blender, and also free assets. One of the things that I really love to double click on is there are loads of free assets out that we can use for the sake of prototyping. We don't necessarily need to, uh, to worry about the copyright, but when it comes to actual product, we definitely need to consider that. But it would speed up the thought process, speed up the iterations. So I try my best to not lock down, to get locked down with just 
not too focusing on the tools and on the assets when it comes to especially the earlier stages of a design process. Next stage, um, if you're thinking about um, interaction design and like having interactive prototypes would be Unity, which I would suggest everyone to have a basic understanding. I don't necessarily think designers should know Unity ins and out, just know how to interact, know how Unity works, that's enough. And maybe using um, plugins such as VR Builder or uh, VR Interaction Framework is good enough for designers to jump a start to communicate their ideas um, in Unity. But at the end of the day, Unity isn't a very like design-oriented tool. I don't know how developers are actually using Unity day to day. That that could change if you use better tools, which is designed for the sake of mixed reality or virtual reality design process. And the best tool out there is Shapes of XR. Apart from um, the the chance that I had to work on the product, I always go back to Shapes XR. The reason why is you don't need any um, technical knowledge to use that. And it's very easy to put an idea at different stages of an idea, at different views of an idea, and share that with the stakeholders, with product managers, or even if you play that a bit smart, you could use that for user research as well. You could jump in, prototype an idea. Yes, it's not going to be as interactive as a prototype in Unity, but it would give you enough in order to understand users' interaction. You could observe that, you could um, run user usability tests and learn from that early on your design process. There are other tools in virtual reality that could help you somehow to iterate, to ideate, to think and sketch um, spatially, such as Gravity Sketch, um, Adobe Medium, or um, as Adobe bought it, Adobe Substance Modeler. Um, Google Blocks is you still, um, it's um, not, it's discontinued, but you could um, still access to um, the, um, the hacked models of that. But again, I would go back to, to Shapes XR if, if I was about to choose one and only one tool in order to iterate rapidly. Um, next, let's talk about design best practices. So I know it's a, a kind of a mm, long list, so I'll try to go with them as quick as possible to save us time for, for the actual Q&A. Um, first, first one is user comfort. As you can see, many of these items are, again, a repetition of the previous um, items, as it's not that much of a difference, but I wanted to bring more attention and importance of those into this conversation. User comfort. Comfort is a paramount in MR design. As users are physically wearing a device, designers need to ensure that interactions do not cause strain or discomfort. This includes like managing the weight of the mounted displays, minimizing motion sickness, minimizing body movement or certain angles like placement of certain angles of, of, of elements which is hard to look at, hard to follow, and avoiding visual fatigue. Some of the, some of the things that we usually talk about when it comes to uh, designing for mixed reality and virtual reality is uh, body fatigue, like arm fatigue, gorilla arm, I'm sure you've, you've heard about it, but visual fatigue is also uh, very important. Sometimes we get so hyped and excited about new technologies that we pull whatever we can um, into users' attention. Not being limited to a monitor or a mobile phone shouldn't be the cause of like populating the entire surrounding and entire environment with visual elements. It should have a cause, it should solve a problem for users. Next one is um, spatial mapping and awareness. MR devices can interact with the real world. So understanding and mapping the physical space accurately is very, very crucial. I know many of that is handled by the platform, by the, by the hardware, but there are still tips and tricks that we could use and leverage in order to, um, to basically to design a digital content that plays and behaves in the same consistent manner with the real world, enhancing the sense of immersion. For instance, um, if we are expecting users to map out the um, um, surrounding and mark the physical object uh, to use in, let's say, a game environment and hit some objects or enemies behind that, 
we should communicate that with them and we should make that quite easy to follow um, and then rely on those and then use those. Um, I don't want to name that. There's a game um, on SideQuest, it's a mixed reality game, nice visuals. It would walk you through unnecessary mapping steps, but at the end, it doesn't use or leverage any of those. Um, next one, I'll, I'll call it the frame. And by frame, I don't mean like a flat 2D rectangle or something. When dealing with um, augmented reality or um, mixed reality content, the frame through which the user sees the digital elements must be considered. This frame could be a volume, an, an imaginary volume, an invisible volume, and design must accommodate the field of view and field of movement and field of reach, um, which is not limited and ensure that important of the content, which is visible, which is uh, reachable and interactable within the comfort of users. For instance, if you're designing something to look at, the placement of that could be completely different within this spatial frame compared to designing something that needs to be interacted with, like a button, or you need to, to, to type something like a keyboard. Um, I don't know if you've um, ever encountered to, uh, with any mixed reality or virtual reality design that the keyboard is far away from you, the spawn point of the keyboard, and you need to do extra steps to get the keyboard close enough to interact with it. Next one is um, interaction models. Um, interaction models is, is very, very important. The design should reflect how users interact with both physical and digital elements. This includes gesture controls, voice command, and traditional input methods. The interaction model, the interaction model should be very intuitive and leverage the natural ways the users are accustomed to. Um, sometimes we encounter experiences that are like designed from scratch and the interaction models with good intention has been changed a lot that lead to a very, very deep learning curve, which basically is against interactive uh, intuitiveness of an experience and it would distract and disturb the, the immersion. Um, next one, which is very hand in hand with the um, interaction model is intuitive UX elements. Again, controls, and behaviors in mixed reality should be very familiar to users. Um, the familiarity in, in, in MR, I would believe that is even more important compared to VR. The reason why is in virtual reality, you block users' um, real environment and you have full control to do whatever you want to do. It doesn't mean that we could break um, the, the interaction model and intuitiveness, but you have full control. There, at this point of time, at the same time, there's no point of reference, but in mixed reality, there's always a point of reference in terms of um, the intuitiveness and interaction with physical objects. This means um, this means that using common design patterns where possible to and ensuring the, the learning curve for new interaction isn't um, steep. Next one is use of a spatial sound. I know that um, designers most likely will be focused on visual elements. Um, an interaction um, level, but using and thinking about um, the spatial sounds is very, very important. Sounds play a very crucial role in mixed reality by providing cues about the environment, about the interaction, about the actions. And a spatial audio can help us um, as, as an additional leverage to locate and interact with digital elements to direct the, um, the, the focus and the user experience. Next one is. Um, environmental considerations. Again, we talked about this, but um, to, um, to repeat that, MR experiences should adapt to different physical environments, whether it's a user living room or outdoor park, um, especially with the um, improvement of a technology, we're seeing devices are used in multiple scenarios. Design should be quite flexible to accommodate very uh, varying lighting conditions, the space size, and other environment factors. An example that I could give you, uh, we are working on, on a project which soon be launched. I cannot share more details, but one of the considerations that we spend a lot of time was um, space sizes. Because um, at FitXR, one of the things that we see, our users love to compete with each other and leaderboards and like scoring more and more is very important. But how would you design a fitness um, experience 
that could compete with others, let's say someone is going to play that experience in a two by two environment and another one is going to play the same fitness modality in a six by six meters environment, how are you going to um, equalize those scoring? How are you going to um, play with the layout of the objects and stuff like that? Next one is accessibility. Again, it's very important. Although um, I have a, a kind of a thing about accessibility that we'll, we'll talk about later. We, we all want and love to have accessibility in mind when it comes to designing, to ensure it's accessible for all users, including those with disabilities. Um, but we, could all, we need also to keep in mind the, the level of the experience and the user base that we are targeting. Performance optimization, we talked about it, um, and I, I think we could skip that for now. Another um, kind of best uh, design best practice from my perspective is global versus, versus local design. What, what do I mean by global versus local design? If you think about um, iOS applications, they're kind of forced by Apple to follow the principal interactions and principal design patterns of the operating system. That helps a lot with smoother onboarding, with intuitive interactions, and you would feel everything as part of a global system. And I would say we, we should consider that, um, although I, I'm not like fully on board with all the decisions that have been made for us as um, headset, developers, like the, the, the platform owners. But again, if we, if we think about users' perspective, they're already going through a learning curve of knowing how to interact with the device, with the operating system level. And if we break that massively, we won't succeed. And it requires loads of attention and cognitive load from users. So it's really important to, to take into account the local differences, such as like device-specific inputs and outputs, but also to meet the user needs effectively. Um, next one is um, interactive design, iterative design and testing. Again, this is not new to, um, to mixed reality, but given the evolving nature of mixed reality technology, it's very crucial to adapt an iterative design process. Um, when it comes to tooling, we, talk about, we talked about tools as well, tools such as um, Unity in conjunction to um, VR Builder or VR Interaction, framework or even shapes Excel allows you to have a way more um, speedy iterative and prototyping um, approach and also user testing and gathering feedback is very very important to refine the experience continuously and last but not least is the balance of aspirational and practical this is something that i would say i see in almost every single project from specialty designers who are just new to the um, mixed reality or virtual reality. We get so hyped, we get so excited about new possibilities and we kind of like try to reinvent everything from, from scratch. Uh, we come up with new interaction model, with new placement, with new layout, not considering what has happened before, what worked well, and also not knowing what is in the, um, benefit of the business. One of the things that would differentiate product designers from like visual designers or UX UI designers in my mind is the sense and understanding of business. To, to have business in mind, because if there is no business, if there's no funding, if we're not serving our users good enough, and if they don't desire and they don't find, uh, find our product good enough, there won't be a user base, there won't be a product, and there won't be an opportunity to design for all of us. Um, I wanted also to talk about challenges and challenges in uh, mixed reality um, or design for mixed reality. Uh, challenges in MR is also as diverse as the environments it um, encompass. Uh, there are technical limitations like tracking accuracy um, in different lighting situation, which can affect how real or um, a digital object feels within a space. Uh, for, for example, if a, um, let's say, holographic cup shakes unnaturally on a real table, this immersion is already uh, breaking. Uh, designing for various user environments is also very, very challenging and important. A virtual object can look great in a dimly lit room, 
but may be invisible uh, near a sunny window. That's very important to understand how to come up with designs which accommodate all lighting scenarios, all the space and stuff like that. For instance, um, if we think about designers working on an, an, an MR application for a field service, um, it needs to ensure the virtual in, um, kind of instructions are visible and usable in bright outdoor um, to, to com compare to like something which is a game and you know most likely it would be played um, in a safe, uh, quiet environment. Um, next one is safety. Um, to talk about safety, I thought, um, use an example. Um, I'm sure you've, you've been following this new trend of like doing your house chores in mixed reality, putting your Quest 3 headset and like moving around, doing cleaning, doing like um, cooking and stuff like that. Some activities might be quite safe, but don't ever try like cooking or cutting vegetables in mixed reality. Although the depth sensor in Quest 3 is very good, it is still not a true perspective. It's still warped. It's still, there is a difference and parallax between these. And you might see that your, the knife in your hand is far enough from your fingers, but in reality, it might not be that. Considering safety, when it comes to designing for mixed reality, is very, very important. That could be an off-putting element to put people off for, for a while or completely. Um, another example that I could um, bring is like one of the things that I always regret um, people doing to newcomers to virtual reality and mixed reality is to give them an, a scary um, experience for the first time. Yes, it might be fun for us to watch them getting scared for the first time in virtual reality, but sometimes that would put them off trying upcoming experiences for a while or even forever. Next um, kind of challenge is localization. And why is localization could be a challenge? Because in traditional design, localization is heavily relying on text, on translation, which is language-based. But text isn't the best in virtual reality and, and, and mixed reality. So it's very important to think about localization, to use visuals as possible when it comes to text, to try to minimize the text or use ways to communicate the text um, in a better, more legible way. And again, practically, uh, the last one is being pragmatic and practical. Many experiences are out there. Uh, many MR experiences are designed just for the sake of MR. They don't make any sense in terms of, okay, why should I do this? And or why should I have this in mixed reality? Why not in virtual reality? Why not in augmented reality? Designing MR experiences for the sake of MR is I would say one of the bad um, trends or hypes within the design community, which might lead to um, an interesting piece of portfolio, but it won't provide um, a consistent and desirable user experience. Next, um, I wanted to provide um, kind of a good example for mixed reality. Um, it doesn't need to be like, a wow experience. It doesn't need to be a groundbreaking, like something that no one would have thought about, but finding the right balance, a sweet spot that the experience could um, have additional value or added value is very important. In my opinion, Piano Vision, which used to be a VR experience, but now is also available in mixed reality, is one of those. So in this experience, if you haven't tried it, you will have digital nodes uh, or representation of upcoming nodes um, next to your physical keyboard. And seeing your physical keyboards and interacting with that is very, very important to learn how to play a piano. So you can see what's the purpose and what's the need for this experience to run in mixed reality, what's the need for this um, visual representation of the upcoming nodes and keys, to match with the keys, with the cues, and so you could follow them easily and learn by going through this. This is very intuitive. And as soon as you go through the tutorials, you forget about the experience. You focus on your um, goal as to, to learn the piano. You're not focused on like, oh, this is a mixed reality experience. That's out of the window. And you focus as a user, you focus on what is important to you, which is learning piano. This is, I think, one of the best examples to understand 
not designing MR experiences for the sake of MR, but having users in mind and trying to solve a problem. Um, I also wanted to talk about briefly about the, the future predictions that um, comes to my mind. I don't think they are like super, super far from us, but I wanted to, to touch on a few things. Um, first one is enhanced sensors at tracking. That's no doubt. We will have every single generation of um, VR or um, MR devices will have better sensors, better tracking, um, improved technology would allow us to, to have more realistic experiences in low lighting situations and more um, with higher frequency in terms of tracking and high frequency in terms of refresh rate. That's no brainer. Next one, I think is multi-sensor experiences. I believe um, XR or MR will increasingly incorporate multi-sensor inputs. Um, haptic isn't leveraged massively. We just have vibration, but I think it will become more and more um, valid to especially mixed reality and it would help us to have a more tangible experiences to deepen the, the immersion. Um, ergonomics and user experience as devices are getting um, lighter and lighter and more comfortable, therefore it will have more adaption of um, the population. XR variables will make uh, longer duration of use, more comfortable addressing issues like um, VR sickness and stuff like that. Considering all of these, we will have new use cases for mixed reality as well. Um, XR will find new applications and new errors like remote working, um, training for different ages. Um, education is, is already part of a um, big case for, for mixed reality, but in different scenarios, uh, it will also add new cases for mixed reality. That's for me a huge opportunity for designers to come to explore and become a frontier and have an example of use cases which would happen in the future. And also um, evolving XR softwares. As um, designing for MR is quite new, we don't have too many design softwares for designers. I think the rise of low code or no code platforms such as Shapes XR would help massively um, engineers and designers to facilitate the creation of immersive and realistic um, environment, mixed reality environment. Uh, that was it. Um, I tried to go through these um, quite quickly to save us time for the QA session. Again, I've tried to, to lay the, the foundation. Um, so make sure we have a good understanding of grasp of the basic and when it comes to the QA, we could go deeper in terms of examples and um, questions that you might have. I'll stop my presentation by saying thank you for going through this with me. Oh, thanks, Mo. And, and uh, we actually got a number of questions on Slido. Uh, let me share my screen and let's try to go through them. Do you want me to go through the questions or? I can, uh, as you prefer, I, I can do that or if you prefer. All right, uh, let me answer. start um, with the questions within the chat, if, if you don't mind, because there are three questions here and then we yeah, go. Yeah, them. That's sure. All right. So I have a question here about um, if is there real, any differences to design um, MR across different headsets, let's say Quest 3, Pro, Pico and HoloLens. I would say yes, and it's one of those classic answers. It depends. It depends on type of um, experience that you're designing. For instance, if you're relying on depth understanding, you need to design that on Quest 3. Quest Pro doesn't have a depth sensor. Pico doesn't have two, even two um, color camera, and the mixed reality view is very distorted, very wide. It's, it's like a snake eye on top of your, your head capturing that. So if you want to design a mixed reality experience, which is applicable on all 
um, these headsets or uh, the term would be cross-platform, you need to bring it back to the basic which is available. You need to play it very, very safe. On the other hand, you might say, actually, this experience would be only possible with this level of technology. Therefore, it is only available on this set of devices. Um, when it comes to mixed reality, um, colored pass-through is very important. Um, HoloLens is, I would say, it's a bit different because the field of view is, is way um, smaller compared to Pico and Quest devices. And also the device user base is completely different. Quest and Pico devices are consumer based. Therefore the adoption is easier, but HoloLens is very, very focused on enterprises. So um, the, the interaction models, the visuals, the level of um, information hierarchy is, is completely different. But if we out um, scope the, the HoloLens when it comes to Quest and Pico devices or upcoming devices from other companies, um, I would say it really depends on what we want to, to deliver. Hope I answer that. Next question is about, um, is is possible to share which platform to access uh, free assets? Um, sure. So one of the, the good ones uh, from my perspective is um, Sketchfab. Um, it allows you to go and search 3D assets. There are multiple other platforms uh, that you could go for hunting 3D assets and the community of uh, designers over Slack would provide more and more links. And the last question within the QA, um, chat QA is, uh, there is a development practice to test your application, especially interface. Do you suggest any testing framework um, to test the visual element and 3D interactions in Unity? I would say we don't necessarily need to use Unity in order to test the visual elements. Uh, we could leverage Shapes XR, or if you, you're starting from uh, Figma, faking Figma um, in browser, one of the, the kind of the tricks that I've uh, came up with is to share the Figma prototype link, open that link in browser um, in my Quest device, and then interact with that in the same distance. I like faking it. It's very easy to achieve. It's not the best, but it's, it's doable. But when it comes to interactions, it really depends on the level of fidelity that you want to go for. If you want to check the usability um, and run a usability test, I would say you definitely need to do um, a proper Unity interaction model. You need developers to, to help you with that and then proper usability tests with observation rather than just, uh, it, it should be, I would say, semi-moderated uh, usability session with uh, specific goals to go through. Uh, now go through the, the slide though. So the first question that I see here is, can you provide a personal case study of a start to finish of mixed reality project? How much time for a pre product design, production, user testing, shipping? It's, it's really, really difficult. Um, I can share um, a personal use case as well, but the scope of the project determines how much time you're going to to spend on this. Um, it could vary from, I would say, three, four months to, to a year. Um, what I try to do is usually to squeeze the time in pre-production and design and give more time to production and user um, testing, because that would allow you to learn more and adapt and be more iterative. Uh, one of the examples that I could share with you is um, Zumba, which is a new um, fitness modality, which is launched last week in FitXR. Um, in terms of pre-production, the entire uh, kind of production, I would say, took us about nine months, but you should consider Zumba is an IP, so there is loads of business logistics in the pre-production, in the design you need to get the approval internally. And with the IP uh, production would come with different um, challenges and user testing uh, could be quite limited because it's kind of a, a secret project that you need to, to you cannot like outsource completely user testing and shipping. But I would say nine months doing other small site projects was a, a time estimation for that. Um, can you tell us more about your user testing process, i.e. what kind of metrics and how do you measure? It, it really depends 
what um, user testing basically you do. Sometimes I, as I said, I use um, ShapesXR for earlier stages of a design just to observe users interaction um, to see if they follow the, the direction that is intended by design, if they get the purpose and overall user flow. Um, when it comes to the metrics, um, uh, time to success, the error rate, and um, kind of completion as usually the, the metrics that we use. Uh, but again, if you go through the higher fidelity of design process, um, you need more moderated um, sessions to see and observe. I would personally say when it comes especially to, to XR designs, I usually benefit more from observation by like defining goals, defining user flows, defining tasks for users, asking them to, to take out those tasks, observe without helping them and see the succession, uh, the succession rate as, as a kind of a, uh, a measure for that. Could you share some tips for design scenarios where users in different physical space compete in shared experience like you were mentioning? Yeah, this is very, very challenging. Um, some of the things, it goes back to like the basics of game design mindset. For instance, if you are comparing two runners, one running um, 10 meter and the other one running 100 meter, how you're going to scope these and equalize these two running uh, session together. You need to do some sort of a calculation and that comes out of the design. You usually need to um, involve your um, data scientists or your developers in this conversation. But when it comes to like designing for different scenarios, I would say the best approach to a start is to capture, that's exactly what we did, to capture, to 3D capture different environments and then start testing your designs, like importing those 3D captures in ShapesXR, in Unity, in Blender, and testing your layout, your designs within those. One of the things that um, I did for a personal project, I booked um, a WeWork building in London. There are multiple rooms, multiple setups, multiple furnitures. I went there during a, a working day and I 3D scanned as much as I could. It gave me 12 different room setups um, to test the layout. And those 12 room setups gave me enough understanding of building something um, scalable. How often do you test fit XR with users? Uh, what protocols do you use? Um, do you outsource any of it? We don't usually outsource uh, user testing. We'd like to, to do it as much as we can with ourselves. The reason why is that we couldn't find any like reliable platform um, to outsource fit XR, for instance, um, to outsource user testing for virtual reality and mixed reality. When it comes to web and traditional um, Product design, there are well-known like usertesting.com uh, platforms that you could use and leverage to, to outsource user testing. But when it comes to um, mixed reality, there are a couple, but they're still in the early stages, I would say. In terms of how often, how regular we test, it really depends on the, uh, the life cycle of the product. Um, we tend to start testing our product at FitXR with users whenever the first layer of interaction is ready, whenever is something playable. We don't necessarily wait till the polishing phase, like the visual could be gray boxes, but whenever we have something which is playable, we could say, okay, consider this gray box as let's say a queue, I consider this gray sphere as something to, to avoid and play it. And how do you feel about it? That's a level that we start testing it and going through like the polish phase, we um, speed up the testing um, frequency with users. Um, I'm not sure I understand what protocols do we use, if you could uh, elaborate on that part of your questions. What are some must have hard soft skills uh, you look for when hiring a start designer? So that's um, different questions, but why not? Um, I would say hiring XR designers uh, the basics that I'm looking for is problem solving. Um, if you're really good at problem solving, um, you would learn that you need to learn a new software. That's a problem for you. And you come up with solutions and you learn that. 
if you're good at problem solving, you learn what is user's problem and you solve that. So problem solving shouldn't be just focused on user's problem. It will be as you or your team or your company problems as well. But apart from that, knowing how to communicate and articulate your ideas uh, and sharing those in a visual term, just like showing them, not telling about your ideas, it's, it's a massive um, hard skills for me for a designer. I've um, worked with many designers who are amazing, who are like creative, but when it comes to articulating and backing up their ideas, they lack and they tend to talk about their designs rather than like showing and representing that. We need to keep in mind that other stakeholders are non-designers and they don't necessarily interpret what we say in the same manner. But if we bring something visually into the conversation, that would help with the better um, communication and more alignment. In terms of softer skills, collaboration, open mind, being uh, not being attached to the design, that's something that I still see in designers like holding their ideas and their kind of outcome and deliverables so loved and so attached to themselves that they cannot let go of, that they would hurt if someone comes with a feedback. Um, that's one of the, the top soft skills that I'm personally looking for hiring designers, designers who could detach themselves from the, the work that they're doing and could be the hardest critic of their own work. Do you think the uh, inherent difficulty in advancing MR technologies like real-time object recognition, segmentation has um, hamstrung the use case of MR? Mm. I'm not sure, to be honest. I think the advanced technologies are still in the, they're not mature. For instance, Quest 3, um, if you, had access to a developer kit, um, you would have go through the, um, the room setup differently. The version that is out there now, if you buy Quest 3, is far better. The technology was exactly the same thing, but the, the user interface, the user flow was completely different. So same technology, same sensor, same hardware, but the way that that technology has been utilized was completely different. Um, I don't necessarily think that would harden the, the use cases of MR. I think it would um, allow more use cases or more accurate use case, but it, it, it's a really vague and an open conversation. I'm, I'm uh, willing to have more conversation about this. How can we better um, test the accessibility and adaptability of MR experiences? Any tool or methodology you can share? Um, in terms of tool or methodology, unfortunately, there is no tool um, that we could use as, as a tool which is available to everyone when it comes to these kind of um, usability testing or user testing. For instance, at FitXR, we tend to build our tools internally. We tend to incorporate that testing capability into the builds and then go around and test it with different things. For instance, the way with, that we build the, the first MVP of um, a project that we're going to launch soon was in a way that you could reset the room setup every single time going through that experience. And that allows us to capture room um, data as well. So we would capture the point cloud system and compare those together. And we would use that as a um, testing method, method, but that's only available to us because we build that tool for ourselves. Have you integrated uh, generated AI to any of your projects? Um, yes. Um, I'm not sure which one I can share with you. I personally have been using generative AI for um, in in the in the prototyping phase, in the the presentation that you uh, just uh, witnessed. Um, I used AI generation in texture creation, in um, kind of a rough three D. It's it's very very early stage, but three D two text has helped me to speed up the process instead of like going with gray box. Now I have more detailed um, proxies and rough objects to play with those. Um, also, text to image massively helped a lot in terms of like hacking and prototyping. Um, environments also use um, a skybox for generating skyboxes, 
and that helped with again prototyping and communicating concepts for environment designs but most of them so far has kind of um stayed in the earlier stages rather than in the actual production because the ar generated images or textures or models aren't that um high quality to be used in the production and also they're not optimized so you need to go through like polishing and optimizing them which if you don't create those models or those um, assets in first place polishing and optimizing those would take more time compared to like creating those from scratch and then optimizing them uh what are your thoughts on extending physical space with virtual areas uh looks like a promising direction but also introduce a lot of safety usability i'm not sure i understand if you're referring to like things such as portals or windows um there are safety issues for sure um i've seen people like trying to interact with the portal with a giant portal and just getting um, into the walls and stuff like that especially now with the quest 3 um optional uh, removing the, the boundary um uh, that the boundary errors you could easily run to a wall but i'm not sure i, I get your questions completely if you could elaborate more on this that would be amazing you were mentioning that you tried the apple vision pro in the beginning do you think this will be a device that would be good for xr fitness apps as well um okay um as this is recorded i have to um, think about what I'm going to share because uh, there was an NDA about that. What I have tried, what I've experienced in terms of Vision Pro, I would say it's not really designed for fitness, but it has really good use cases for wellness. So if you could differentiate fitness from wellness, um, fitness isn't the, um, the one of the main um, use cases, at least from what I can interpret from the, the physical appearance and the build of uh, Vision Pro, but I'm sure it, it's coming. Because if you think about um, Apple ecosystem, it does make sense. They own one of the biggest fitness platforms, Apple Fitness Plus, and they own the hardware and the software and the ecosystem. So it would be a big miss for them if they don't consider um, fitness for a Vision Pro. Uh, what are your thoughts on oh, 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 we went through this um what are the biggest mistakes people make in regards to flawed design thinking when moving into xr especially mr initially i think one of the, the biggest mistake um, as i mentioned is being super excited and hyped and just designing mixed reality or xr experiences just for the sake of xr and not thinking about what are the actual user problems, what are the things that you're trying to, to do? Is it safe? Does it make sense to expect a user to purchase a headset, purchase the, the product, put on that headset, which needed to be charged previously? So there's, there's a lot of planning and then go through this. If that's yes so far, what are the benefits? What are the alternatives of, of doing this? That's one of the, 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 the biggest kind of mistakes. Another thing is, to me, is like trying to reinvent everything from scratch. Um, we don't necessarily need to, to avoid 2D um, interactions and 2D UI elements. There is nothing wrong with that. Unless you have rational and valid um, information about this, the flat UI is hurting the user experience, is not benefiting the user experience. Because many user experiences which try to like come up with spatial or diegetic UI elements lead to um, lack of discoverability, which is very, very important for mixed reality. Why? Again, going back to the principles, you don't um, control the user's attention. You can just direct that. that users could just um, um, wander around and miss the interactions that you design spatially and diegetically. Um, is there an equivalent equivalence of design system for mixed reality XR? I think MRTK may be the closest. I agree with you, MRTK is, is the closest. Uh, there are certain like um, individual designers who've been trying to put together some sort of a design library. I wouldn't say a design system. Uh, most of them are design libraries. Uh, but 
there's nothing like completely as a design system compared to MRTK. Um, I think uh, with the launch and release of um, Vision Pro, we'll get closer to having a design system in place. Uh, but most likely till then we will have just design libraries um, designed for specific um, needs and desires. What AI tool did you use for the text to 3D assets? Um, it's called, the one that I'm recently using is called Luna um, Jenny. Um, it's accessible on Discord and it's for free. It's very, very similar to early days of uh, Mid Journey, if you remember those, which is not far. Uh, there are other tools if you just Google um, 3D to um, text to 3D. Many of them are still in the closed beta, so you might have trouble getting access. But um, Luna Jenny is um, the one which is easy to access on Discord right away. Um, how do you use a recruitment for user testing? How many users do you consider an acceptable number when testing Excel features? So when it comes to uh, recruiting users for usability, it, it really, again, it depends on what you're testing. For instance, if we are testing a new feature or new fitness modality for FitXR, we don't necessarily need to go uh, and find and recruit users with our previous experiences with VR. We actually need users who are part of our user community. We have um, a very active and large Facebook community, which we usually dive in when it comes to recruiting uh, users for user testing. Um, and they're very, very willing and collaborative when it comes to, to those. But when it comes to like more basic um, user testing, it, we go through colleges, we reach out to students, we reach out to um, community and groups that we, we build connection. It, it's, it's a bit hard um, to answer these questions, not basically marking the specific uh, projects. But there are multiple multiple ways. I would say the best way uh, for personal projects is to start building up a user testing group, which is a group which are willing to share their times with you, like thirty minutes a week or in a month, and um, keeping them um, engaged and active. We're just sending them updates and asking them to to take up different tasks. What software should a skilled UX designer coming from 2D designs into XR design, no, at the minimum to be considered hireable. It's really depend on the company you're applying. Some companies, some groups, as they have built a solid pipeline and solid tool set, they would expect you to come and join knowing their specific tools. For instance, at Gravity Sketch, we when we were hiring designers, we needed them to know some sort of a spatial 3D software. It doesn't matter. It, it didn't matter which software, but we expected you to understand spatial thinking and a spatial delivery in terms of just communicating your ideas, especially. It could have been the Gravity Sketch tool itself. Uh, but for instance, I would say being really good at UX design, being really good at Figma, knowing the, the spectrum of tools and plugins available to Figma for earlier stages of um, XR design are good. ShedFXR is a really good tool, but it's not well known in the industry. So most likely you won't be hearing like teams expecting you to know ShedFXR. But um, if you know a bit of a 3D, just like not modeling in 3D, knowing how to download a 3D asset, put together some things, let's say in Blender, and do a turntable, do a, a, a few screen recordings, screenshots, renders, and stuff like that, that should be enough. The next level, in order to turn to a very hireable, in-demand um, designer in XR, would be knowing Unity. Um, I would say Unity, because in my experience, 85% of experiences are designing Unity. The top-notch qualities are in Unreal. Unreal isn't that. Um, the, the learning curve of Unity is very, very uh, lower compared to, to Unreal, but Unreal outcome is completely different. But if you know the basic of Unity, not coding Unity, not designing from scratch, and knowing again uh, something like uh, VR Builder, which is a free add on, we can download that from Unity Asset Store, or VR Interaction Framework, which is not free, I think it's about £50, if I'm not mistaken, that allows you. Um, those um, interaction models, uh, those add-ons are not that easy to use, but again, 
with spending a bit of the time, you could learn how to prototype um, ideas and that would help you communicate and get better uh, value in, in design teams. What role does a storytelling play in XR design? A massive role, but in earlier stages of the design. Uh, for instance, when we were working on Zumba, earlier stages uh, included the storytelling in XR. Uh, but we started with um, storytelling in 2D, like a traditional storytelling. And then in order to communicate that better, uh, we kind of recreated the same kind of flat 2D traditional storytelling in, in 3D using Chef's XR. So um, it, it could be really important if you're talking about uh, new interactions is very, very important. If you're talking about new user flows and you want to make sure the user flows is quite clean and understandable, not just for the users, for the stakeholders, for the, um, the, the team members that you're collaborating with, um, the storytelling and the spatial storytelling is very important, which I personally use ShapesXR and also Gravity Sketch. Gravity Sketch is also good for storytelling. You won't have that like framing and a staging uh, feature that you have available in ShapesXR. There is no interaction model, but yet you could still use Shape, um, Gravity Sketch to, to do spatial storytelling. And there are many users um, using that in, in industrial design, in product design, and also in XR design. Is Unreal Engine on your radar at all? Yes. Uh, Unity is the main one. Um, all three companies that I've worked um, related to XR were using Unity, uh, but Unreal is my on, on my radar for my personal projects. Again, it's very hard. The learning curve is very very steep, and I'm struggling finding uh, free time to to learn more about Unreal Engine. Uh, great presentation, thank you. A wonderful illustrations. Thanks to Mid Journey. Uh, uh, any tips on prompting? I would say the best tip on prompting would be uh, going reverse engineering. Find any good images on um, Mid Journey app that is created by others. If you like that, go and find the, you could right click and read the, the prompt and try um, that the same prompt first, try to change that. Um, another kind of trick would be feeding the images that you like into Midjourney and asking Midjourney to describe that for you and then reiterate on that prompt. I played that and that helped me a lot to learn like a few tips and tricks. Are there any books or online resources you recommend for designing moving into Excel? I would say uh, most likely you've all um, read that book. Um, design of Everyday Objects by Don Norman. That's for every sort of computer human interaction design. That's like a must to read. Um, there are a couple of more like the the creative. I, I'm, I'm just uh, let me bring them here. I think if you're into textbooks, this one is very good. Creative augmented and virtual, uh, creating augmented and virtual um, realities. It's, it's, it's a thick O'Reilly book, but it's one of the like industrial standards. Uh, this one is also good. It's more focused on the UX. There are chapters that you can easily skip because it tries to um, basically communicate UX for non designers as well. So, like for business owners, startups, uh, entrepreneurs, and stuff like that, there are chapters that you can skip. Uh, but I believe you in the right direction um, with XR Bootcamp in terms of knowledge base. Uh, if you were to scroll down, uh, when recruiting user, uh, test users, how do you avoid biases? Examples, people who are more willing to test are usually those who are more proficient and enthusiastic in XR. That's a really, really good um, question. That's one of the most challenging aspects of um, recruited users in terms of bias, not just for, for XR, for any type of usability. Uh, what we try to do is usually try to do a bit of a kind of um, a screening interview with them. Let's say we go out and we um, send a request for people who would like to, to join this session. And let's say we get um, 50 submission. We go through some sort of a screening, a very short call to, um, to understand and categorize groups of people. 
and avoid biases. But again, it's very hard. What I've been trying to do is through the observation, I try to mark and categorize users through the observation. If I sense that there is a bias, then I will regulate the insights of this session differently compared to like um, avoiding it or ignoring it completely. I, I, I hope that I answered your question. Anything in particular that is most exciting to you right now about the industry? Most exciting to me, um, I would say Apple um, entering the, the competition. I'm not really excited about the device itself. I'm excited about, about the, the ecosystem that Apple usually supports. Apple supporting their ecosystem, their hardware and their software is very, very um, game changing, especially for designers. That would bring some sort of a standard to the industry. If you um, look at the Meta's announcement and visual communication after the Vision Pro announcement, you can see that they've learned and they are inspired by Apple visuals and Apple presentation in terms of how to, how to communicate um, the ideas. They're not like innovating that much, but they're bringing some sort of a unity and, and consistency to, um, to the design for this. That's um, how uh, that's what I'm very, very um, excited about at this point of time in the industry, apart from AI. Uh, next one is anything in particular that is most fun? Oh, I've already read that. Uh, is it the end of the question list? Just in case there are newer questions that we missed, let us double oh. check. Or if you have more question, last minute question, you can also raise your hand now. Yeah. Maybe so I see Tiago having one. Yeah. So uh, in, the, in the meantime, Mo, thank you, first of all, for all the uh these nice explanations and presentation so uh i think tiago is writing now or tiago you can yeah i'll finish i'll finish writing. okay it's okay uh, while you are writing let me ask one question actually for me it's a very like a uh a industry deal uh changer or like a, a trendsetter question that might be so you can answer from both fitness or um, uh, wellness perspective, or you can answer from uh, directly from the whole uh, landscape of gaming and non-gaming perspective as well. When you look at MR uh, and when you look at like, okay, let's say Quest 3 will be used by millions of people uh, inside their rooms. What could be a very interesting gameplay or like this kind of like a... Um, wellness or fitness um i would say like functionality that or gameplay mechanic or like an app mechanic that we have never seen before and it can only be achieved with mr okay are yeah. you do you have hope on that that we will see definitely. a completely definitely. new mechanic and what could be on your perspective definitely and that lies to um the new project that we're going to launch soon in um, December. Uh, one of the um, limitations of fitness for virtual reality is due to safety, you cannot move that much. So let's say most of the time you stand within a limited area. Yes, you do your upper body workout, you might do squats and stuff like that. You might step to the sides, step to the back, but that's it. What if you want to run? What if you want to use real weights like dumbbells what if you want to do um push-ups towards the the floor or, or walls what if you want to do pull-ups those kind of fitness exercises or activities that requires your body to move further and without seeing your surroundings you cannot do that with the true uh, color pass through with the good perspective on quest 3 only not even on quest 2 because lack of the, the depth sensor, time of flight sensor. You, I don't know, if, if you have access to Quest 3, give that a try on your own uh, risk. Put your Quest 3 on and start slowly walk around your environment. That's doable. That's 
easy to do. But in virtual reality, on Quest Pro or on Pico, it's not because of lack of the depth sensor and lack of the, 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 the distortion of, uh, of the reality. And opening that for fitness, that means you can bring more exercises, more calorie burning exercises, harder difficulties, uh, more time spent in, in actual experience because you're not bored, you're not limited to certain movements. It's not yeah. just jumping jacks, you could do more and, and that. And that's very exciting and very kind of opening, at least for the, fit, uh, for the fitness um, industry, for, for Excel. Similar things, similar hope, you could think about other kind of movement as well. Um, if it's gaming, again, in gaming, most of the, the virtual games um, that care about your safety and your experience would limit your body movement into a certain area. So most likely you would just spin or rotate in place. You won't be walking around. But with mixed reality, if you've seen like zombie shooters um, or the first um, encounter by Meta, it allows you or in, in basically engage you, involve you, and it interests you from walking around and experiencing that. So it's, it's a very, very um, opening um, moment in, in, the, in the industry. Perfect. Uh, maybe, Dokan, if you can also, Billy, if you can invite Paul, maybe uh, he, he also... Uh... Uh, may say a few words before we uh, wrap up if he can join if not uh, let's take Tiago's question how would convince sell a company 100% focused on Vision Pro to work and develop for other devices like the Quest uh, I can also I can also add this to this question um, if a company is already using Apple products on almost everything Right, all the Max, everything, like the whole ecosystem you mentioned. Is there any chance that this company also starts using Quest 3? If there is a company which is convinced 100% to focus on Vision Pro without having a dev kit, without having an actual user base with that hefty price, I would love to learn from them. <laughs> I, I, I won't like fight for them. I just I, I would love to genuinely learn from them. If they're one hundred percent focused and and like convinced, that means they have a user case which I'm not aware of. Therefore, I don't try to to convince them to use other devices. The difference, if if you really want to create something tailored for Vision Pro, you have to use their platform um, development pipeline. Yes, you can port. Unity experiences to Vision Pro, but that's not going to be the best experience. It would be like designing um, applications at the same time for Android and iOS. So it, it's completely different pipeline. You need different teams, different skills, which doesn't exist at the moment. So if a company really convinced, I would love to learn from them. Uh, just a quick, maybe my opinion is, uh, I, I, would, I would not uh, see that it will be because of a specific app that they are convinced, but because just they just, if their whole team is remote and they are almost like digital nomads and they their team are always complaining that they don't have monitors uh, in their own uh, remote locations that they are portable, they, they try to bring portable monitors, right, all around. So maybe it can be a nice uh, like investment for, for the company, for the productivity of their employees. I don't know uh, if there's anyone. I mean, I'm, don't, don't get me wrong, I'm an Apple fanboy. And I've been working on my health to sell my kidney to get one of the Apple Vision Pro as soon as it's out. <laughs> but do we know when it's actually out? Do we know when it's going to be available? They said early 2024 in US and late 2024 in Europe. So we still don't know. Do we know how many um, units are going to be um, shipped? We still don't know. And when it comes to like companies relying on that, that's that sounds too risky for me, to be honest with you, unless you, you have some sort of magical unlimited yeah. funding. It uh, is for the first iteration of Apple Vision Pro, let's say, right? Yeah. Perfect. Paul, uh, do you have any uh, any uh, maybe additions before we finalize? Because we are already um, time. Yeah, so I just want to say I apologize for not being able to show up for this whole thing. Um, I got pulled into a demo with Unity uh, earlier. Um, but yeah, I think for Vision Pro, uh, App, uh, Quest Pro is probably the best way to 
um, to prototype that um, because it has eye tracking, you know, it's very different in terms of resolution and all the certain elements of quality, but um, yeah, jumping into Shapes XR or into Unity and being able to uh, play around with eye tracking and, and gaze and pinch uh, to get a feel for that. Uh, I would, that's what it seems like people are doing um, to yeah. get ready for that. Um, or, you know, or signing up for the developer um, sessions uh, at Apple and going on site and uh, testing it out in person. But yeah, it's, it's that's that causes its own challenges. We did that uh, once and we're planning on doing it again, but um, waiting for things to mature a bit more first. Yeah, perfect, perfect. So um, shall we wrap up, uh, Billy? Anything else? I mean, for the assignments, you have pre and post assignments um, coming up for everyone here. So uh, we will have mentorship session, uh, I think in the next couple of weeks. Uh, Billy already shared the list. Um, feel free to uh, ask questions on Discord. Um, Mo, if you are interested, we can also add you to, to the server. So you can also interact with the uh, cohort. And if you have, and uh, new projects coming up December, etc. I think there will be plenty of people in this cohort that might be interested in having yeah. some kind of expert and user uh, feedback for you guys uh, in case you are uh, sure. opening some kind of beta or any kind of testing. Um, so we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll have um, a public MVP launch in December, and that experience is part of the uh, FitXR app. Uh, so you need to be a FitXR member but it's fully designed for mixed reality. Perfect. Uh, so, yeah. If there is any chance that we can try out beforehand or at when launch, we have even some uh, some uh, of our graduates here, Hans and Kate here today. I invited them uh, especially for this session because they are they did one week of prototype, fitness-based prototype, uh, when they were just, um learning unity and vr development now they are in on stage of uh, releasing for app lab uh, so of course they are at the beginning of the stage but it, we are so proud of uh, students who are really attempting to publish something um, valuable for the for the um this whole base i think it's a very nice opportunity so uh, happy to also give feedback and uh, work together with you more Sure thing. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Paul and Mo, um, for the uh, assignments and live mentorship. Uh, we will uh, catch up uh, based on the uh, submissions. So good luck, everyone, for the sub assignments. Billy, anything you would like to say before we close? Uh, so we in this module, we just want to reiterate for this module, we actually shipped to the pre-assignment to right before the mentorship session so that everyone have more time to do it so just uh there's no need to stress yourself to finish it today or for tomorrow exactly and for the mentorship we will go over all of these assignments more you yeah submit met better so we, we can go through that okay perfect thank you everyone okay. thank you more i'll wait thank to see you. your amazing work thank yeah, you thank you Thank you, everyone, and Thank have you. a nice rest of the week. See you on the Discord. Bye. Bye. Bye.